The Hero and Nama genocide was a campaign of collective punishment that the German Empire undertook in German South West Africa now Namibia against the Overhero, the Nama, and the San. It is considered the first genocide of the 20th century. It took place between 1904 and 1908. In January 1904, the Hero people led by Samuel Maharero and Nama led by Captain Hendrik Witbui rebelled against German colonial rule. On January 12, they massacred more than 100 German men in the area of Okahanja, though sparing women and children. In August, German general Lothar von Trotha defeated the Overhero in the Battle of Waterberg and drove them into the desert of Omaheke, where most of them died of dehydration. In October, the Nama people also rebelled against the Germans, only to suffer a similar fate. Between 24,000 and 100,000 heroes, 10,000 Nama and an uncounted number of San died. The first phase of the genocide was characterized by widespread death from starvation and dehydration due to the prevention of the retreating hero from leaving the Namib desert by German forces. Once defeated, thousands of heroes and namas were imprisoned in concentration camps, where the majority died of diseases, abuse, and exhaustion. In 1985, the United Nations Whitaker Report classified the aftermath as an attempt to exterminate the hero and nama peoples of South West Africa, and therefore one of the earliest attempts at genocide in the 20th century. In 2004, the German government recognized and apologized for the events, but ruled out financial compensation for the victims' descendants. In July 2015, the German government and the Speaker of the Bundestag officially called the events a «genocide». However, it has refused to consider reparations. <laughs> <laughs> Background The Hero were originally a group of cattle herders living in the central eastern region of South West Africa, presently modern Namibia. The area occupied by the Hero was known as Damaraland. The Nama were pastorals and traders living to the south of the Hero. In 1883, during the scramble for Africa, Franz Adolf Eduard Luderitz, a German merchant, purchased a stretch of coast near the Angra Pequena Bay from the reigning chief. The terms of the purchase were fraudulent, but the German government nonetheless established a protectorate over it. At that time, it was the only overseas German territory deemed suitable for white settlement. Chief of the neighboring hero, Maharero rose to power by uniting all the hero. Faced with repeated attacks by the Kozen, a clan of the Khoikhoi under Hendrik Witbui, he signed a protection treaty on 21 October 1885 with Imperial Germany's colonial governor Heinrich Ernst Göring, father of Nazi Luftwaffe commander Hermann Göring, but did not cede the land of the hero. This treaty was renounced in 1888 due to lack of German support against Witbui, but it was reinstated in 1890. The hero leaders repeatedly complained about violation of this treaty, as hero women and girls were raped by Germans, a crime that the German authorities were reluctant to punish. In 1890, Maharero's son, Samuel, signed a great deal of land over to the Germans in return for helping him to ascend to the overhero throne, and to subsequently be established as paramount chief. German involvement in ethnic fighting ended in tenuous peace in 1894. In that year, Theodore Lutwein became governor of the territory, which underwent a period of rapid development, while the German government sent the Schutztruppe imperial colonial troops to pacify the region. <laughs> German colonial policy Under German colonial rule, natives were routinely used as slave laborers, and their lands were frequently confiscated and given to colonists, who were encouraged to settle on land taken from the natives. That land was stocked with cattle stolen from the Hero and Namas, causing a great deal of resentment. Over the next decade, the land and the cattle that were essential to Hero and Nama lifestyles passed into the hands of German settlers arriving in southwest Africa. Revolts In 1903, some of the Nama clans rose in revolt under the leadership of Hendrik Witbui. A number of factors led the hero to join them in January 1904. One of the major issues was land rights. The hero had already ceded over a quarter of their 130,000 square kilometers (50,000 square miles) to German colonists by 1903, before the Otavi railway line running from the African coast to inland German settlements was completed. Completion of this line would have made the German colonies much more accessible and would have ushered a new wave of Europeans into the area. Historian Horst Drexler states that there was discussion of the possibility of establishing and placing the hero in native reserves and that this was further proof of the German colonists' sense of ownership over the land. 
Drexler illustrates the gap between the rights of a European and an African. The German Colonial League held that, in regards to legal matters, the testimony of seven Africans was equivalent to that of a colonist. Bridgman writes about racial tensions underlying these developments. The average German colonist viewed native Africans as a lowly source of cheap labor, and others welcomed their extermination. A new policy on debt collection, enforced in November 1903, also played a role in the uprising. For many years, the hero population had fallen in the habit of borrowing money from colonist traders at extreme interest rates. For a long time, much of this debt went uncollected and accumulated, as most hero had no means to pay. To correct this growing problem, Governor Lutwein decreed with good intentions that all debts not paid within the next year would be voided. In the absence of hard cash, traders often seized cattle, or whatever objects of value they could get their hands on, to recoup their loans as quickly as possible. This fostered a feeling of resentment towards the Germans on the part of the hero people, which escalated to hopelessness when they saw that German officials were sympathetic to the traders who were about to lose what they were owed. In 1903, the hero learned of a plan to divide their territory with a railway line and set up reservations where they would be concentrated. This was also one of the reasons for the revolt. The hero judged the situation intolerable and revolted in early 1904, killing between 123 and 150 Germans, including seven Boers and three women, in what Nils Ole. German calls a desperate surprise attack. The timing of their attack was carefully planned. After successfully asking a large hero clan to surrender their weapons, Governor Lutwein was convinced that they and the rest of the native population were essentially pacified and so withdrew half of the German troops stationed in his colony. Led by Chief Samuel Maharero, the hero surrounded Okahanja and cut links to Vindhoek, the colonial capital. Maharero then issued a manifesto in which he forbade his troops to kill any Englishmen, Boers, uninvolved peoples, women and children in general, or German missionaries. The Herero revolts catalyzed a separate revolt and attack on Fort Namutoni in the north of the country a few weeks later by the Ondonga. Lutwein was forced to request reinforcements and an experienced officer from the German government in Berlin. Lieutenant General Lothar von Trother was appointed Supreme Commander German, of South West Africa on 3 May 1904, arriving with an expeditionary force of 14,000 troops on of June. Lutwein was subordinate to the Colonial Department of the Prussian Foreign Office, which reported to Chancellor Bernhard von Bülow while General Trother reported to the military German General Staff, which was only subordinate to Emperor Wilhelm II. Lutwein wanted to defeat the most determined hero rebels and negotiate a surrender with the remainder to achieve a political settlement. Trotha, however, planned to crush the native resistance through military force. He stated that, My intimate knowledge of many Central African nations Bantu and others, has everywhere convinced me of the necessity that the Negro does not respect treaties but only brute force. Genocide. General Trotha stated his proposed solution to end the resistance of the hero people in a letter, before the Battle of Waterberg. I believe that the nation as such should be annihilated, or, if this was not possible by tactical measures, have to be expelled from the country. This will be possible if the water holes from Grootfontein to Gobabas are occupied. The constant movement of our troops will enable us to find the small groups of this nation who have moved backwards and destroy them gradually. Trotha's troops defeated 3,000 to 5,000 hero combatants at the Battle of Waterberg on 11 to 12 August 1904, but were unable to encircle and annihilate the retreating survivors. The pursuing German forces prevented groups of hero from breaking from the main body of the fleeing force and pushed them further into the desert. As exhausted hero fell to the ground, unable to go on, German soldiers acting on orders killed men, women, and children. Jan Cleet, acting as a guide for the Germans, witnessed the atrocities committed by the German troops and deposed the following statement. I was present when the hero were defeated in a battle in the vicinity of Waterberg. After the battle all men, women, and children who fell into German hands, wounded or otherwise, were mercilessly put to death. Then the Germans set off in pursuit of the rest, and all those found by the wayside and in the sandveld were shot down and bayoneted to death. The mass of the hero men were unarmed and thus unable to offer resistance. They were just trying to get away with their cattle. A portion of the hero escaped the Germans and went to the Omaheke Desert, hoping to reach British territory of Bichwanaland. Fewer than 1,000 reached Bichwanaland, where they were granted asylum. To prevent them from returning, Trotha ordered the desert to be sealed off. 
German patrols later found skeletons around holes 13 meters (43 feet) deep that had been dug in a vain attempt to find water. Some sources also state that the German colonial army systematically poisoned desert water wells. Mahiro and 500 minus 1,500 men crossed the Kalahari into Bichwanaland, where he was accepted as a vassal of the Batswana chief Sekgoma. On the 2nd of October, Trotha issued a warning to the hero. I, the great general of the German soldiers, send this letter to the hero. The hero are German subjects no longer. They have killed, stolen, cut off the ears and other parts of the body of wounded soldiers, and now are too cowardly to want to fight any longer. I announce to the people that whoever hands me one of the chiefs shall receive 1,000 marks, and 5,000 marks for Samuel Mahiro. The hero nation must now leave the country. If it refuses, I shall compel it to do so with the long tube cannon. Any hero found inside the German frontier, with or without a gun or cattle, will be executed. I shall spare neither women nor children. I shall give the order to drive them away and fire on them. Such are my words to the hero people. He further gave orders that This proclamation is to be read to the troops at roll call, with the addition that the unit that catches a captain will also receive the appropriate reward, and that the shooting at women and children is to be understood as shooting above their heads, so as to force them to run away. I assume absolutely that this proclamation will result in taking no more male prisoners, but will not degenerate into atrocities against women and children. The latter will run away if one shoots at them a couple of times. The troops will remain conscious of the good reputation of the German soldier. Trotha gave orders that captured hero males were to be executed, while women and children were to be driven into the desert where their death from starvation and thirst was to be certain. Trotha argued that there was no need to make exceptions for hero women and children, since these would infect German troops with their diseases. The insurrection, Trotha explained, is and remains the beginning of a racial struggle. Regardless, German soldiers regularly raped young hero women before killing them or letting them die in the desert. After the war, Trotha argued that his orders were necessary, writing in 1909 that, "...if I had made the small water holes accessible to the womenfolk, I would run the risk of an African catastrophe comparable to the Battle of Beresonia." The German general staff was aware of the atrocities that were taking place. Its official publication, named Der Kampf, noted that, this bold enterprise shows up in the most brilliant light the ruthless energy of the German command in pursuing their beaten enemy. No pains, no sacrifices were spared in eliminating the last remnants of enemy resistance. Like a wounded beast the enemy was tracked down from one water hole to the next, until finally he became the victim of his own environment. The arid Omaheke desert was to complete what the German army had begun, the extermination of the hero nation. Alfred von Schlieffen chief of the Imperial German General Staff approved of Trotha's intentions in terms of a «racial struggle» and the need to «wipe out the entire nation or to drive them out of the country», but had doubts about his strategy, preferring their surrender. Governor Lutwein, later relieved of his duties, complained to Chancellor von Bulow about Trotha's actions, seeing the general's orders as intruding upon the civilian colonial jurisdiction and ruining any chance of a political settlement. According to Professor Mahmoud Mamdani from Columbia University, opposition to the policy of annihilation was largely the consequence of the fact that colonial officials looked at the hero people as a potential source of labor, and thus economically important. For instance, Governor Lutwein wrote that, I do not concur with those fanatics who want to see the hero destroyed altogether. I would consider such a move a grave mistake from an economic point of view. We need the hero as cattle breeders and especially as laborers. Having no authority over the military, Chancellor Bulow could only advise Emperor Wilhelm II that Trotha's actions were "...contrary to Christian and humanitarian principle, economically devastating and damaging to Germany's international reputation." Upon the arrival of new orders at the end of 1904, prisoners were herded into concentration camps, where they were given to private companies as slave laborers or exploited as human guinea pigs in medical experiments. Topic. Concentration camps Survivors of the massacre, the majority of whom were women and children, were eventually put in places like Shark Island Concentration Camp, where the German authorities forced them to work as slave labor for German military and settlers. All prisoners were categorized into groups fit and unfit for work, and pre-printed death certificates indicating, "...death by exhaustion following privation," were issued. 
The British government published their well known account of the German genocide of the Nama and Hero peoples in 1918. Many Hero died later of disease, exhaustion, and malnutrition. Estimates of the mortality rate at the camps are between 45% and 74%. Food in the camps was extremely scarce, consisting of rice with no additions. As the prisoners lacked pots and the rice they received was uncooked, it was indigestible. Horses and oxen that died in the camp were later distributed to the inmates as food. Dysentery and lung diseases were common. Despite those conditions, the hero were taken outside the camp every day for labor under harsh treatment by the German guards, while the sick were left without any medical assistance or nursing care. Shootings, hangings, beatings, and other harsh treatment of the forced laborers, including use of box, were common. A 28 September 1905 article in the South African newspaper Cape Argus detailed some of the abuse with the heading, In German SW Africa, Further Startling Allegations, Horrible Cruelty. In an interview with Percival Griffith, an accountant of profession, who owing to hard times, took up on transport work at Angra Pequena, Lutteritz, related his experiences. There are hundreds of them, mostly women and children and a few old men. When they fall they are sumboked by the soldiers in charge of the gang, with full force, until they get up. On one occasion I saw a woman carrying a child of under a year old slung at her back, and with a heavy sack of grain on her head. She fell. The corporal sumboked her for certainly more than four minutes and sumboked the baby as well. The woman struggled slowly to her feet, and went on with her load. She did not utter a sound the whole time, but the baby cried very hard. During the war, a number of people from the Cape in modern-day South Africa sought employment as transport riders for German troops in Namibia. Upon their return to the Cape, some of these people recounted their stories, including those of the imprisonment and genocide of the Hero and Nama people. Fred Cornell, a British aspirant diamond prospector, was in Lutteritz when the Shark Island concentration camp was being used. Cornell wrote of the camp, Cold, for the nights are often bitterly cold there, hunger, thirst, exposure, disease and madness claimed scores of victims every day, and cartloads of their bodies were every day carted over to the back beach, buried in a few inches of sand at low tide, and as the tide came in the bodies went out, food for the sharks. Shark Island was the worst of the German South West African camps. Lutteritz lies in southern Namibia, flanked by desert and ocean. In the harbour lies Shark Island, which then was connected to the mainland only by a small causeway. The island is now, as it was then, barren and characterized by solid rock carved into surreal formations by the hard ocean winds. The camp was placed on the far end of the relatively small island, where the prisoners would have suffered complete exposure to the strong winds that sweep Lutterets for most of the year. German commander von Estorf wrote in a report that approximately 1,700 prisoners including 1203 Nama had died by April 1907. In December 1906, four months after their arrival, 291 Nama died a rate of more than nine people per day. Missionary reports put the death rate at 12 to 18 per day, as many as 80% of the prisoners sent to Shark Island eventually died there. There are accusations of hero women being coerced into sex slavery as a means of survival. Trotha was opposed to contact between natives and settlers, believing that the insurrection was the beginning of a racial struggle. And fearing that the colonists would be infected by native diseases, Benjamin Madley argues that although Shark Island is referred to as a concentration camp, it functioned as an extermination camp or death camp. <laughs> <laughs> Medical experiments and scientific racism Prisoners were used for medical experiments and their illnesses or their recoveries from them were used for research. Experiments on live prisoners were performed by Dr. Bowfinger, who injected Hero that were suffering from scurvy with various substances including arsenic and opium. Afterwards, he researched the effects of these substances via autopsy. Experimentation with the dead body parts of the prisoners was rife. Zoologist Leonard Schultz noted taking body parts from fresh native corpses which according to him was a welcome addition, and he also noted that he could use prisoners for that purpose, an estimated 300 skulls were sent to Germany for experimentation, in part from concentration camp prisoners. In October 2011, after three years of talks, the first 20 of an estimated 300 skulls stored in the Museum of the Chariot were returned to Namibia for burial. In 2014, 14 additional skulls were repatriated by the University of Freiburg.
Topic: <laughs> Number of victims. A census conducted in 1905 revealed that 25,000 hero remained in German South West Africa. According to the Whitaker Report, the population of 80,000 hero was reduced to 15,000 starving refugees between 1904 and 1907. In colonial genocide and reparations claims in the 21st century, the socio-legal context of claims under international law by the hero against Germany for genocide in Namibia by Jeremy Sarkin Hughes, a number of 100,000 victims is given. German author Walter Noon states that in 1904 only 40,000 hero lived in German South West Africa, and therefore, only 24,000 could have been killed. Newspapers reported 65,000 victims when announcing that Germany recognized the genocide in 2004. Aftermath With the closure of concentration camps, all surviving hero were distributed as laborers for settlers in the German colony. From that time on, all hero over the age of seven were forced to wear a metal disc with their labor registration number, and banned from owning land or cattle, a necessity for pastoral society. About 19,000 German troops were engaged in the conflict, of which 3,000 saw combat. The rest were used for upkeep and administration. The German losses were 676 soldiers killed in combat, 76 missing, and 689 dead from disease. The Rietedenkmal English, equestrian monument in Windhoek was erected in 1912 to celebrate the victory and to remember the fallen Germans with no mention of the killed indigenous population. It remains a bone of contention in independent Namibia. The campaign cost Germany 600 million marks. The normal annual subsidy to the colony was 14.5 million marks. In 1908, diamonds were discovered in the territory, and this did much to boost its prosperity, though it was short lived. In 1915, at the start of World War I, the German colony was taken over and occupied in the South West Africa Campaign by the Union of South Africa, acting on behalf of the British Imperial Government. South Africa received a League of Nations mandate over South West Africa in 1919 under the Treaty of Versailles. Recognition In 1985, the United Nations Whitaker Report classified the massacres as an attempt to exterminate the Hero and Nama peoples of South West Africa, and therefore one of the earliest cases of genocide in the 20th century. In 1998, German President Roman Herzog visited Namibia and met hero leaders. Chief Munjuku Nuvorva demanded a public apology and compensation. Herzog expressed regret but stopped short of an apology. He pointed out that international law requiring reparation did not exist in 1907, but he undertook to take the Hero petition back to the German government. The Hero filed a lawsuit in the United States in 2001 demanding reparations from the German government and Deutsche Bank, which financed the German government and companies in southern Africa. With a complaint filed with the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York in January 2017, descendants of the Hero and Nama people sued Germany for damages in the United States. The plaintiff's suit under the Alien Tort Statute, a 1789 U.S. law often invoked in human rights cases. Their proposed class action lawsuit sought unspecified sums for thousands of descendants of the victims, for the incalculable damages that were caused. Germany seeks to rely on its state immunity as implemented in U.S. law as the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, arguing that, as a sovereign nation, it cannot be sued in U.S. courts in relation to its acts outside the United States. On 16 August 2004, at the 100th anniversary of the start of the genocide, a member of the German government, Heidmarie Weeks or Exuel, Germany's Minister for Economic Development and Cooperation, officially apologized and expressed grief about the genocide, declaring in a speech that, we Germans accept our historical and moral responsibility and the guilt incurred by Germans at that time. She ruled out paying special compensations, but promised continued economic aid for Namibia, which currently amounts to $14 million a year. The Trotha family traveled to Omaruru in October 2007 by invitation of the Royal Hero Chiefs and publicly apologized for the actions of their relative. Wolf Thilo von Trotha said, we, the von Trotha family, are deeply ashamed of the terrible events that took place 100 years ago. Human rights were grossly abused that time. Repatriation 
Peter Karchivivi, a former Namibian ambassador to Germany, demanded in August 2008 that the skulls of Hero and Nama prisoners of the 1904–1908 uprising, which were taken to Germany for scientific research to «prove» the superiority of white Europeans over Africans, be returned to Namibia. Karchivivi was reacting to a German television documentary which reported that its investigators had found over 40 of these skulls at two German universities, among them probably the skull of a Nama chief who had died on Shark Island near Lutteritz. In September 2011, the skulls were returned to Namibia. As part of the repatriation process, the German government announced on 17 May 2019 that it would return a stone symbol it took from Namibia in the 1900s. Topic media A BBC documentary Namibia, Genocide and the Second Reich explores the hero, Nama genocide and the circumstances surrounding it. In the documentary 100 Years of Silence on YouTube, filmmakers Halfdan Muerholm and Kasper Eriksson portray a 23-year-old hero woman, who is aware of the fact that her great-grandmother was raped by a German soldier. The documentary explores the past and the way Namibia deals with it now. Mama Namibia, an historical novel by Mari Serebroff, provides two perspectives of the 1904 genocide in German South West Africa. The first is that of Jehohora, a 12-year-old hero girl who survives on her own in the Welt for two years after her family is killed by German soldiers. The second story in Mama Namibia is that of K.O.V., a Jewish doctor who volunteered to serve in the German military to prove his patriotism. As he witnesses the atrocities of the genocide, he rethinks his loyalty to the fatherland. Thomas Pynchon's novel V had a chapter set in Shark Island concentration camp in 1904. Jackie Sibley's Drury's play, We Are Proud to Present a Presentation about the Hero of Namibia, formerly known as Southwest Africa, from the German Sudwest Africa, between the years 1884 to 1915, is about a group of actors developing a play about the hero and Nama genocide. Link between the hero genocide and the Holocaust The hero genocide has commanded the attention of historians who study complex issues of continuity between the hero genocide and the Holocaust. It is argued that the hero genocide set a precedent in Imperial Germany that would later be followed by Nazi Germany's establishment of death camps. According to Benjamin Madley, the German experience in South West Africa was a crucial precursor to Nazi colonialism and genocide. He argues that personal connections, literature, and public debate served as conduits for communicating colonialist and genocidal ideas and methods from the colony to Germany. Tony Barter, an honorary research associate at La Trobe University, argues that the hero genocide was an inspiration for Hitler in his war against the Jews, Slavs, Gypsies, and others who he described as non aryans According to Clarence Lusani, Eugen Fischer's medical experiments can be seen as a testing ground for later medical procedures used during the Nazi Holocaust. Fischer later became Chancellor of the University of Berlin, where he taught medicine to Nazi physicians. Ottmar Freiherr von Verschuer was a student of Fischer. Verschuer himself had a prominent pupil, Joseph Mengele. Franz Ritter von Epp, who was later responsible for the liquidation of virtually all Bavarian Jews and Roma as governor of Bavaria, took part in the hero genocide as well. Mahmoud Mamdani argues that the links between the Holocaust and the hero genocide are beyond the execution of an annihilation policy and the establishment of concentration camps, and there are ideological similarities in the conduct of both genocides. Focusing on a written statement by General Trotha translated as I destroy the African tribes with streams of blood. Only following this cleansing can something new emerge, which will remain. Mamdani takes note of the similarity between the aims of the general and the Nazis. According to Mamdani in both cases there was a social Darwinist notion of «cleansing», after which «something new» would «emerge». See also Genocides in history List of genocides by death toll Research materials, Max Planck Society Archive Congolese genocide, perpetrated in the Belgian Congo not universally recognized as a genocide <laughs> Original German texts <laughs>